Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar by the IIT ACB. Uh, the IIT Alumni Center Bangalore was set up by a group of alumni from across the various IITs, basically with the intention of providing a platform that allows for networking and collaboration amongst IIT alumni from, from all the IITs, as well as with industry. And our focus is on helping India become more innovative and become a leader in science and technology. Uh, joining us today are two very illustrious uh, speakers. We have Dr. Satya Gupta, uh, and he is the uh, founder uh, president, founder of the, one of the founders of the Epic Foundation, which is a not-for-profit focused on uh, making India a leader in semiconductor, uh, semiconductor electronics. Uh, previously, he was with uh, Intel and then uh, has also been, has worked on several startups. Uh, he's also the president of the VLSI Society of India. Anyone who has heard him speak with passion about uh, where India can go with respect to uh, the, the uh, whole area of electronics and semiconductors would know that he's about the best person we could have presenting uh, this topic today. Joining him is Dr. Siddharth Das, uh, also from Intel, uh, also from IIT Delhi. And uh, he has, after again, after a very illustrious uh, career in Intel in the US, came back to India and, uh, and was heading up uh, uh, Intel Capital uh, here, he is now the general partner of Venture East Capital. And uh, so the, the format today is, is a little different from our usual webinars. We have Dr. Satya Gupta who will present the first part of the, of the, uh, the, the session today. So he will make a presentation this will be followed by a discussion between Siddharth and Satya. And, uh, but please keep sending your questions in. You can put them all into the Q&A box. We will be picking them up and uh, uh, posing these questions to our panelists uh, as, as uh, we are going along. Dr. Abha Mishra, professor at the Indian Institute of Science, and I, we are co-hosting the, the uh, the webinar today, and we have immense pleasure in welcoming you and thanking both Satya and Siddharth for taking the time to be with us today. With this, I will hand over to Satya. Please, Satya, please go ahead and make your presentation. Thank you so much, Sushila, and uh, good evening to everybody. First of all, I would like to thank ACB and Saturday webinars to give me this opportunity to talk to all of you about the one of the most happening and the important area of electronics and semiconductor. Uh, my association with IIT started in 1883. From 1883 to 1888, I was part of IIT Delhi. Doing my MTech as well as basically part of the uh, uh, care uh, Center for Applied Research in Electronics at IIT Delhi, where I also served as a senior scientific officer. And I would like to thank especially Professor Anshul Kumar, who introduced me and guided me in my earlier career towards basically semiconductor and VLSI design uh, with very audacious project of basically uh, doing a complete end-to-end -end chip design, starting with a high-level description language, Lachana, which he created during his PhD program. And many other people, Surinder Prasad, uh, Professor Ma, uh, M. Balakrishna, and so many colleagues at IIT Delhi helped shaping my character in basically technology. So uh, today I'll be basically discussing with you how to make India as a electronics and semiconductor nation. And I believe, and a lot of other people believe along with me, is that the products are the lifeline of the nation and the industry. And that's what we want to focus basically in today's presentation. So if you look at the 
electronics as a whole, it has become a meta resource powered by the semiconductor, which is very essential for any country's growth and strategic uh, importance. And there is no sector of our industry, of our day-to-day -day life, which is not touched by the electronics, which is powered by semiconductor today. In a day, probably from morning till now about five o'clock, we would have basically used hundreds of electronics products, which are powered by thousands of the semiconductor chips, which basically does various functions. And this whole electronics products are powered by the technologies, obviously semiconductor, IoT, cyber physical system, 5G communication, AI, ML, AR, VR, uh, high performance computing, and so many other areas. So it has become a very integral part of our day-to-day -day life, as well as it has become a very strategic for a country, just like a nuclear or basically atomic energy or space would have been. Today, if you don't have a semiconductor technology with you, you cannot be basically having the same strategic status as any other country. So if we look today's scenario, uh, we have a very fast and aspirational society. Uh, if you look at last uh, 70 years, India took 67 years to reach 1 trillion GDP. Uh, second 1 trillion was achieved in seven years and third 1 trillion was achieved in basically very short span of three years, right? And because of this growth in GDP, our consumption of the electronics products is also growing at very fast pace. Uh, I think by end of the decade, we would be consuming more than $500 billion of electronics products. Uh, which is currently about 300 to 270 to 300 basically billion dollars, right? Uh, so we have a very strong market. Uh, the second vector is basically we have developed very strong manufacturing ecosystem for electronics products over last uh, about eight years from 37 billion to over 300 billion dollars uh, currently, we do manufacturing of electronics product today, and which basically kind of uh, represents about 70% of the consumption being manufactured, right? And this has been made possible by policies like PLI and other schemes which government of India has put together to grow the manufacturing ecosystem. Okay. Third, basically, Pillar of this industry is obviously trained and skilled workforce, which we have. Uh, so today, India is has a, one of the largest pool of engineers. Uh, we graduate more than 1 million uh, engineers every year, thanks to IITs and other technical institutes. India is a center for uh, having R&D units of almost all the electronics and semiconductor companies in the world. It started for semiconductor started in 1985 with Texas Instruments setting their uh, design center in India and subsequently so many other global companies uh, have set up the uh, global, uh, global competence center in India. There would be hardly any company which does not have a design center in India. And even before early efforts of the uh, doing the chip design at places like ITI and others, which has basically created this uh, uh, huge uh, trained manpower ecosystem. Today, we have about 1.25 lakh chip design engineers, which is probably the second uh, to the United States in this particular area. And we have more than five lakh or about half a million embedded engineers. Considering the importance of semiconductor and electronics, many organizations, including MIT, VLSI Society of India, IESA, AICT, are working of different ways of generating more 
manpower and talent in this area. So if you look at the three vectors, market, manufacturing and manpower, India has a very strong presence, right? So if you put uh, all of this together, reminds me a basically old movie from basically people who have the gray hairs. Uh, many of you might recognize this scene from uh, one of the iconic movies from Hindi film industry called Diwar. And it had a very famous dialogue. Uh, maybe uh, most of you would might know this. Mere paas ma hai. So what we saw basically in last three slides, we have market, we have manpower, and we have manufacturing, which are three basic ingredients of uh, uh, this whole sector. But if we see the other side of the things, mere paas product nahi hai. So we don't have pa, which basically represents the product ecosystem in electronics. Now, putting this in the context with some data, uh, if we see all the electronics products we consume, I think less than 10% of these products will be Indian brand, Indian products, right? We are basically consuming 90% or more global brands and global products. Although we might be manufacturing them, but the share of the Indian products and Indian brands in electronics is less than 10%. And if you look at the data a uh, little bit more, about 30% of what we consume is completely imported. 70% is manufactured in India, either for global brands or for Indian brands. And if you look at the imported uh, uh, numbers, obviously imported products will not have Indian with, uh, uh, value addition or Indian products. And about 70% of these imported products out of 30% are coming from China. If you see the manufactured product, uh, which is about 70% of what we consume, the domestic value addition is less than 20%. Out of the 70%, less than 10% are domestic. And about more than 60% are coming from the basically uh, Chinese brand. So, so what are the implication of this, right? When we don't have a domestic products or domestic company designing these products, we don't have the say on what components are used, where do we buy it. Those decisions are made either in Shenzhen or Cupertino or Seoul by basically uh, large electronics companies. So uh, uh, when you don't have say in what do you buy and where do you buy from, that certainly has a big implication on development of the component ecosystem. Obviously, it has economic implications because uh, if you look at iPhone, for example, right? Product company is Apple, manufacturing company is Foxconn, Vistron, Pegatron, right? So 70% of the profits goes to Apple and maybe about 8% goes to Foxconn or Mistron or somebody like that out of the bomb, right? So Apple kind of make about $700 per iPhone this sell, and maybe Foxconn, Mistron make somewhere around $30 to $50. So obviously it has a very significant economic implications when you don't have your own products and you are doing just manufacturing. Security implication, if you are not products, you don't know what is going inside those products. And self-reliance because uh, manufacturing itself is not sustainable, it's not sticky. Uh, so to make the whole thing sticky, you need to have your own products, which we are missing right now. 
So just to illustrate the point where basically we are today, I'll take uh, as an illustration, India smartphone or mobile phone market, right? Uh, which probably all of you will very uh, uh, easily grasp. So if we look at the mobile phone manufacturing from 2015 to 2022, okay, we have grown from 189 crores to 2.75 lakh thousand, uh, 2.75 lakh crores. So almost basically uh, a growth of uh, 15 times. Okay. So spectacular growth in the manufacturing of the mobile phone. And today probably out of our requirement uh, of about 30 to $40 billion mobile phone, probably 90% or more we are manufacturing and a significant portion is growing in the ex export market also. At the same time, when we grow the manufacturing, if we look at the share of the Chinese branded phones in Indian market in 2015, I think Chinese brands were less than 5%, maybe about 2%. And as of 2022, we have basically 75% of the market share by the Chinese brands of Oppo, Vivo, OnePlus, Xiaomi, MI, all of those things. Right? So as our manufacturing group, uh, maybe it's a coincidence, maybe it's by design, uh, but share of the Chinese products and Chinese brands also grow. And to compound this, the share of the Indian brands, which was about 15% in 2015, has come down to less than 1%. So this is what the current state of things are. We are doing very well in the manufacturing, but basically our huge product market is basically slowly being captured by uh, global brands, especially Chinese brands and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, so manufacturing group, share of Chinese product grew from 5% to this thing. So if you look, this kind of suggests that countries like China and US and others, okay, they have realized the value of the products and very strategically, they move from electronics manufacturing to electronics products and brands. So decade of 2010 to 2000, basically 20 was probably manufacturing, but the current decade looks like basically uh, they have shifted the gear towards the electronics products and brands. Uh, and they are okay with Vietnam and other countries taking the manufacturing, uh, including India. And if we see the next step in the strategy, they want to basically now become uh, very strong in the semiconductor chips, which go into these products, right? Uh, and they were marching very well on this till basically US decided to put some cups of this thing. Uh, to give some data on this, uh, uh, Chinese processors, in Indian mobile phone market were basically almost 0% about four years back, okay? Today, if we look somewhere around 17% of mobile phones which we consume are not only coming from Chinese brand, they also have Chinese processor. And that's where basically uh, strategy wise countries like China are going, uh, uh, so I think the whole point of this discussion is, I think we need to learn how to basically put our foot forward in basically this area and learn strategic things which other countries are doing. So obviously electronics product and semiconductor products are very intertwined and they go hand in hand. And if you look today, we have uh, electronics products where the share of the Indian brands and Indian products is less than 
And if you look, semiconductor products where the chip are coming from the Indian company, uh, probably whatever we are consuming, we produce less than 1% uh, from Indian companies and Indian brands. Right? So this obviously requires a change. This is non-sustainable situation. And this is, uh, uh, the change is extremely required to become self-reliant in this most strategic technology. So as a goal, if we can become 33% market share of the electronics product, in today's global market, you cannot have very uh, exclusivity on these things. So while there is a good place and market for the global products, if Indian products and Indian brands can achieve 33% of the share of the total consumption we do, that presents an opportunity of $133 billion for Indian companies and Indian products. Okay, if we look the same way for semiconductors and we aspire to have 33% market share of whatever semiconductor we consume today, that presents a basically opportunity of $33 billion. Okay. So this is the need of the hour. Opportunity is very huge. And to become a strong country on the world stage, we have to have uh, self-reliance through Indian products and Indian brands, both in electronics and semiconductors. Okay. So we talk about market manufacturing manpower, those are okay. We need to build Indian products. I think Indian ecosystem is very fast, basically adopting technology through uh, digital finance, digital healthcare, digital education, communication, mobility, smart cities, data centers, servers. So all of these areas are providing the ample opportunities for basically electronics products to be developed through Indian company, through Indian brands, using the foundation of the market, manufacturing and manpower, three mass of basically our strength. So if you look at a typical food chain of uh, electronics products, how they come in our hand. So top of the food chain is obviously a customer, uh, which is people like you and me. Some of us are basically iPhone type and some of us are Android types. Uh, uh, we buy our products from the brands and the product companies like Apple, Oppo, Vivo, HP, Dell, Cisco, Samsung, LG, and so many others, right? And uh, wherever I go and basically have a face-to-face -face interaction with people, I generally ask, give me five uh, Indian brands in electronics products, which have basically significant market share or significant presence, and I could hardly get anybody go beyond three. So these electronics products obviously need a lot of semiconductor chips uh, to make this product basically better and cheaper year over year through the innovation in the semiconductors. These semiconductor chips come through two sources. One is basically IDMs, which basically provide the semiconductor chips to the electronics product brands and manufacturers. These IDMs have their own products, have their own fabs and ATMP units. So they basically do design manufacturing products, branding themselves, and then provide these products to the uh, electronics product companies. And semiconductor companies like Intel, Micron, and Samsung will fall into their category because they have the products, they are manufacturing, they are packaging, all the three things, and they sell the products in their own brand. So the second source of these chips is uh, what we know as a fabulous semiconductor companies. Uh, 
companies like Qualcomm, AMD, NVIDIA, they have their products which with they conceive, design, brand and sell, but they don't manufacture these products. They get basically them manufactured through contract manufacturing. So basically OSAT, which is outsource uh, uh, assembly and test uh, by companies like ASC and MCOR, they package the chips, which are basically manufactured by companies like TSMC, SMIC, GF, et cetera, through their semiconductor manufacturing facilities. So there is one ecosystem, which is IDMs, and then there another ecosystem, which is Fabless. And that's where the foundry, OSET, and all of those things come into the picture. So obviously, other than market and other things, just to map the capability landscape, if you look at the, uh, I will not go through the everything, but the two areas where we are not very strong, which is basically domestic semiconductor products and domestic electronics products. Uh, we do well in everything else, market, electronics manufacturing, embedded software, system design, semiconductor design, and now semiconductor manufacturing is also beginning to take shape, right? But the two of the weakest spots are semiconductor products, which are of the Indian origin, Indian design, Indian branded, and same for the electronics products. And that's what basically uh, uh, the focus for India should be going forward. Now, putting the whole thing into a complete perspective, if I have to say my vision of basically India electronics and semiconductor product ecosystem, which is a self-reliant ecosystem, we need to focus on three broad areas. One is products, which could be electronics products and chips and ICs. The second is manufacturing, uh, EMS and other things for electronics products and semiconductor fab, ATMP, OSAT and all of those things. And third, very important, research and talent development ecosystem, which can produce long-term research to provide the future technology as well as basically quality talent to develop uh, products and other things. So if I have to, if I have a hundred dollar of incentive, which I have to spend on three areas, right? Uh, since manufacturing is very capex incentive, whether it's a electronics manufacturing or semiconductor manufacturing, I'll suggest we take 85% of the share to incentivize the manufacturing. We take 10% of the share to incentivize the product development through various government and other incentives. And we spend 5% of our basically uh, $100 in research and talent development across all the sectors. Right? And if we can commit $50 billion of government of India investment over 15 years across electronics and uh, semiconductor, this will give a return of investment of $250 billion to the country. Some of this, the government has already done, and I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, obviously, this whole ecosystem has to be supported by talent development at the grassroots level, scaling, design, research, manpower, infrastructure for basically developing the industry in this area. Manufacturing industry, especially, it takes a lot of infrastructure development. Product design, especially in the mechanical plastic uh, and uh, what we call is repairable, reusable, recyclable products. Uh, raw material equipment, supply chain, government to government relationship. All of those enabling factors will be needed other than the incentives provided to products, manufacturing and research, right? And obviously this has to be supported by, by long-term policies. Uh, and we need to learn from countries like Taiwan, Israel, South Korea, Japan, and US to build a very thriving domestic ecosystem for electronics and semiconductor products. So, 
just to give a glimpse of what the government has done on the manufacturing side, uh, they have the schemes like PLI and India Semiconductor Mission, which was announced about two years back. PLI is about three years back. Uh, on the design side, uh, product design side, there is a scheme called Design Lake Incentive, and I'll talk to uh, about briefly about that in subsequent slides. And then C2S and other programs to support research and talent development. Okay, so just elaborating government's efforts in this area. Okay, if we look at the manufacturing, what the government of India and other states have done, India today provides 70% plus incentive for semiconductor manufacturing, which includes semiconductor fab, different kind of technology, different type of the nodes. For the display fab, either LCD or AMOLED, uh, packaging, ATM, PO set, compound semiconductor and silicon photonics type of the technology. Overall outplay is $10 billion and 50% of the overall project cost is going to come from the central government from this $10 billion kitty. And different states are offering 20 to 25% of the incentive on top of the Government of India incentive. So if you take that include in 10 billion, so there is almost 14 to 15 billion dollar incentives are there for anybody to set up semiconductor manufacturing facilities in India. To best of my knowledge, this is globally the best incentive any country is providing today. Okay, it includes every country. Uh, I think these incentives are the best in the category for semiconductor manufacturing. Okay. Now, if you look at design side of it, uh, semiconductor chip design requires basically significant investment from the startup of the companies which want to do the semiconductor chip design as a product, right? For that, the central government is basically giving 50% of the project cost in reimbursement. In addition to that, all the EDA tools from the leading vendors are provided through national EDA grid, as well as facilitation and support for acquiring the IP cores, manufacturing uh, to the leading foundries and all those things are provided through this program, including a chip in center at CDEC, which will basically help in taping out uh, the chips from these companies. Uh, so this is basically uh, total outplay of 1,000 plus crore. Depending on the need, this number can go much higher than 1,000 crore, but at least it's 1,000 crore plus today. And each project can basically unveil, uh, utilize 1,000, uh, sorry, 100 crore plus through the incentive. So if your project cost is 200 crore, then as a 50%, you can get up to 100 crore or more through basically this DLA program. Uh, and unlike basically a lot of incubators and other places, there is no equity, no basically uh, other financial conditions. So in my experience, this is the most unique scheme across the world. Okay. Uh, which gives such a fantastic incentive in terms of the operational cost, as well as basically EDA tools through national EDA grids. Typically EDA tools constitute about 15% to 20% depending on your project. So 50 plus uh, another 15 also you take 65% of the project cost is basically uh, incentivized by the government. In addition to that, when your chip is ready, you are ready to sell, then whatever amount you sell, suppose you sell chips worth $1 million, four to 6% of that volume which sell, which will be subsidized by the government or given as a subsidy to this thing. So if you are basically uh, selling $1 million worth of the chip, then you get basically 40 to $60,000 back from the government. 
This will make your chip prices more competitive because initially startups may not get the right wafer pricing, right basically product pricing. So this is a very fantastic initiative by the government, which is designated as a design link incentive, also known as the feature design uh, uh, scheme. Third lack of basically government scheme is manpower development and research. So government of India is running the SMDP program for last 30, 40 years. And now it is basically in the fourth phase. Uh, the first phase started in 1998. Uh, and now we are basically uh, in the fourth phase, uh, which basically will support 100 plus academic institutions with uh, manpower development, financial support, EDA tool supports to help develop the right talent to these 100 institutes. There are several other schemes other than the SMDP, which provide the research opportunities for academic institutes in the microelectronics. And there is a future skill program, which is targeting to address the growing need of the skilled VLSI design engineer, as well as uh, manufacturing engineers and manufacturing technicians, which will be required once the India Semiconductor Mission Program takes off. So without going into details, uh, more than 100 institutes are being supported with all uh, what they need with the outlay of about 250 crores. And research in microelectronics, maybe other several hundred crores being given for a special targeted programs as well. So going back to the overall theme of making India as a electronics and product nation, uh, based on the analysis of the what may be required. I have a few suggestions or thoughts which I wanted to share with all of you. Uh, whenever we thought, think about the incentives given to industry, most of the incentives so far have gone towards the manufacturing side. If you look at the PLI and the ISM and all those things, right? So my suggestion or a humble suggestion to the government and the policy makers Whenever we provide the incentives for the manufacturing, we provide 10% of the manufacturing incentives for product development to the industry. For example, if we are providing $20 billion of incentive for the manufacturing, reserve $2 billion for the incentive of product development to the industry. So, can, so we can have very competitive in terms of the quality, cost, uh, and every other thing, products which can basically realize this $133 billion opportunity, which is sitting with us, right? I think second important thing, most of the basically government scheme, look at Make in India products, but the current Make in India product calculations are basically uh, somewhat skewed towards only manufacturing. Our basically suggestion or my humble suggestion is that you add the design component to make in India calculation. For example, if you, if the product is designed in India plus manufacturing also is done in India, then design portion could be given about 10% of extra points for basically calculating the MII. Similarly, if the software ownership and the product ownership is in India, then there could be extra points given in the Make in India calculation. Third is that many of the countries develop this ecosystem through government procurement. Like if you look at the initial days of semiconductor industry in US, most of the buying happened through Pentagon and DARPA. So, if we can leverage in India also, the government does a lot of procurement of electronics, be it smart camera, tablets, uh, laptops, and other devices, and so on and so forth. If we can reserve 25% of this government procurement to local product company, 
obviously subject to meeting quality and price that can <coughs> create strong leverage from the same money which we are spending right we are spending let's say 100 crore rupees and buying basically smart cameras for a city if 25 percent could be uh, given to the domestic companies which are designing the products in india and also have the brands in india then basically that can help in creating basically bootstrap for the product ecosystem okay fourth semiconductor chips are very important we are less than one percent of the market share today if you have to make fabulous chip companies making semiconductor products more viable uh, currently we are giving for four to six percent of the uh, deployment incentive under dli but i think for semiconductor chips that's not sufficient i think it could be initially given about 20 percent dli on the chip sales uh, which will help in basically creating a competitive uh, semiconductor companies fifth is basically about the talent I think we need to create early awareness in the talent developed ecosystem, uh, such as basically create excitement and awareness for electronics and semiconductors at the school level itself, right? So that when they kids choose a career for their graduate undergraduate studies, they look at electronics and VLSI design as a very favorable subject because that gives them the uh, uh, entry into very exciting products and development and to get that the right quantity and quality of the design and uh, manufacturing engineers in this space i think we need to start the undergraduate program in electronics and vlsi at at least 100 plus colleges and aict MIT, and other organizations are working towards the development as of about six months back aict has given a go ahead to start a btec program which is focused on electronics and vlsi and they have also created a model curriculum and all of those things so things are moving in in the right direction but these are the five suggestions i thought i could give as a part of making india as a electronics and product nation so finishing my discussion with basically plans that let's work together to make India as an electronics and semiconductor product nation. Uh, thank you all of you for joining. And I will hand over to Shushila now to go to the next segment of the program. Thank you so much. May I invite uh, Siddharth to join uh, Dr. Satya on the panel? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Shishi. Siddharth, how are you? Uh, good. Uh, good to uh, chat with Satya. Satya and I go way back in time. So it's, uh, it would be good to do a Jugal Bandi here. Uh, so, uh, so I, before I get into that, I just wanted to, uh, by the way, good evening to everyone who's joined. Uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of a history on India's uh, tryst with semiconductors, you can call it, uh, so that there is a context to some of the discussion we, I have with Satya. So I would say that, uh, you know, Semiconductor Complex uh, Limited, which was set up by the government that was in 1982, so at that time, and for the next two decades almost, we were basically in a sanctions regime which was off and on. And uh, so that uh, there was, that compelled us, India obviously, to develop its own kind of uh, chip capabilities. So SCL was set up with that purpose. Other than that, there was also a need in, especially in the space sector and the defense sector, for very high speed ICs. But again, these were not mass volume, but basically very, uh, you know, high performance 
uh, ICs uh, in a very custom quantities for mainly the space agencies and some of the Department of Defense. And uh, that, uh, that was a critical, uh, obviously, driver for many of the programs that were set in stage at that time. Also, in light of the fact that we were primarily in a protectionist regime at the time, a different form of Atman Nirbhar, perhaps not the same uh, objectives, uh, there were brands which were actually created, you know, electronics brands. Uh, BPL Electronics comes to mind, and there were quite a few others. Of course, there were, in many of these, there were some foreign col collaborations, but they were really indigenous brands, which had, uh, you know, a significant success for a certain period of time. Now, this whole uh, uh, period of sanctioned regime plus our own protectionist regime uh, that lasted for about roughly 20 years. So by 2002, the US and most of its Western allies and Japan had lifted some of the sanctions on India. This happened post 9-11. And after that, we saw quite a flurry of activity. The first activity we saw was in many of the EMS, electronics manufacturing services that Satya was talking about. They, they set up shop in India. Most of them were there, Jibil, Selectron, Flextronics, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, my power just went away. So I'm talking in the dark. Uh, so uh, some of them, the EMS shops set up, then there was also very serious discussions in terms of setting up something by way of semiconductor facilities, backend facilities. That there were lots of discussions with various semiconductor companies in the Valley. Ultimately, that did not fructify. I think maybe Cyprus, SunPower may have set up something in Hyderabad, more on the solar side. Uh, but that was a period where there was much promise and hope, but many of these things did not happen. And at the time then, the government also started looking at its own policies. So a semiconductor policy actually came out in 2007, and soon after that, I think by 2009, 10, there was some electronics policy. So uh, government was certainly moving in the direction of certain uh, progressive or positive policies. Uh, and so we, we, then we got into basically, you know, the mobile manufacturing, Nokia, Foxconn, uh, many of them set up their manufacturing facilities in Chennai. And uh, so there was a momentum and uh, so that lasted, I think, about, uh, you know, until 2021. And I would say uh, 2021 in December, the government took note of the fact that, uh, especially in light of the fact that there could be a China plus one policy, uh, that uh, they need to get serious about this sector. So the electronic sector and semiconductor sector, starting in December 2021, got a lot of attention. And today we probably are looking at the phase three of our evolution as a country. So I would uh, first of all like to ask um, Satya, I mean, in terms of the way forward, uh, I mean, he had uh, a lot of information, a lot of very useful recommendation, and certainly many things which are very useful for entrepreneurs because he has been himself a serial entrepreneur. So uh, looking at this phase three, which I define, that's my own definition, phase three, people may differ on how many phases we have had. What is the way forward? How do you see it kind of playing out, at least in near-term visibility? Satya, you have to unmute. Thanks, Edna. Uh... Thank you for taking us through the journey of last 30, 40 years in semiconductor. Uh, the way I see, as you said, third generation of our attempt, right? What is different from the previous attempts, right? One thing is that the first time very definitive and holistic policies in the place, right? Earlier, there was basically ad hoc incentives and basically this thing. This time it's a very uh, well-defined policy which is covering semiconductor manufacturing, semiconductor product design, and semiconductor product development, as well as the 
infrastructure and ecosystem which is required to support the semiconductor manufacturing. So the policy covers basically all of those things. ISM covers basically incentive for semiconductor manufacturing. DLI covers basically incentive for the chip design. SPACs covers the basically incentives for infrastructure and incoming raw materials. And programs like C2S and R&D in electronics support the talent development. So it's a very well thought out policy, right? Second thing is that it's a very strong support from the bureaucratic and political leadership for this program, right? Which I have not seen in the previous two or three attempts. Uh, we have been, all been part of it. So I think these things occur very well in terms of where how the government is basically putting the whole thing together. Now, going forward, uh, obviously something advanced note, semiconductor fab, lots of you might have heard news about Vedanta, Foxconn, ISMC, IGSS, and other people, right? The advanced note fab will take somewhere three to four years to basically put up. And then probably a year to get operationalized and the right yield and all of those things, right? So while we are doing that, there are two other areas basically which could be focused and which is happening. Uh, one is ATMP, where either a OSET type of the company, which is doing the packaging and testing for service for other companies, or some IDM, as I explained in my slides, the companies which do complete product development themselves, they can put a packaging and testing facilities in India. So that's one. And I think very soon something is going to be announced in that area. Second is that while we are basically preparing and putting our foot forward for advanced node semiconductors, right? We could look at things like compound semiconductors, technologies like GAN and silicon carbide which are essential for power electronics, which can help India's energy mission. And the second part is basically India's electrical mobility. Both of them can benefit very significantly from GAN and silicon carbide type of compound semiconductor. And third angle is basically all the radio frequency equipment, whether it's a 5G or radar, that also get very much benefited by compound semiconductors like GAN and silicon carbide. And it doesn't take that much investment. Like typical silicon fab will take minimum $3 billion investment today. Whereas a compound semiconductor fab can be put in about $100 million. So it's a 30X lower investment and probably it can be made operational in about two years, right? Third aspect is, which is very important is the DLI scheme and semiconductor products. We can build all these fabs and everything, right? But it's like a building without occupant. If we don't have products to put in these foundries because we are not making IDM fabs, we are making foundry type of the fabs. So we need chips to be put into these fabs. Obviously we have to convince some big global majors, but if the domestic companies cannot put their products in these fabs, then long-term sustainability and long-term self-reliance will not be achieved. So we have to very strongly focus on the DLI and accelerate this 100 startups, fabulous startups, which are targeted for through DLI. My personal goal is basically 1,000 such startups, not 100. Uh, we have to figure out a way to reach there. I want to see, and third is that we need to democratize this whole thing, right? If we just... Chip design today should become just like a software product design. Okay. Hey, three people with an idea go to Goa Beach and start coding for a chip. Okay. Without much capital, without much infrastructure. That's where India will prosper. Every district of India should have at least one fabulous startup. And that's where we will achieve our goals. So that is very important because without that, manufacturing facilities will not be duly utilized, there may be, utilization may be high through global products, but we need to put at least 10, 15, 20% of the domestic products also in these fabs. So that is, I'll say, way forward. And third is angle is talent development. Uh, I've been saying in various forums 
so far we have been basically focusing the talent development through masters and phd program it's time that basically we bring the electronics and vlsi to the grassroots level and start teaching our kids very early in the undergraduate level this technology even in the undergraduate don't wait till third year start basically teaching them from the first year unlike us i think today's kids have much more ready to absorb this technology we were like little stupid when we entered the college right but i think today's kids are much more smarter much more basically uh, capable of absorbing technology so let's not wait let's get the vlsi design type of the technologies in undergraduate start from the second semester teaching them basically concept they should do one chip tip out before they graduate i think that should be our goal that's a great suggestion so that, that's actually a good segue to my next question see uh, what you mentioned about i'm focusing on silicon right now just for uh, some uh, uh, extrapolation or interpolation whatever you might call it i believe that the government is very serious about uh, silicon fab which is in the technology node of 40 nanometers and 20, going down to 28 nanometers sure so in those particular nodes what kind of products do you envisage that india can do whether it's local product design or global products what would be kind of the focus sectors okay so what i was saying is that if you look at the node by node analysis of the foundry capacity today okay other than the advanced technology node there are two nodes which are very resilient in terms of the business value one is 28 nanometer and one is 180 nanometer right 180 nano uh, to 28 nanometer today also basically somewhere around basically 12 to 14% of the global market and 180 nanometer will be somewhere around 5 to 6% even if though that old and year over year we are seeing that they are not declining where other intermediate nodes like 90 65 and all those things are slowly declining but 28 nanometer and basically 180 nanometer are very resilient because of the type of the chips they can do at the cost of the basically production they do because those fabs are amortized and all of those kind of things you know right business way so now what kind of the product right they are basically plethora of industrial products which can be done on 28 nanometer lot of iot products can be done on the basically 28 nanometer lot of automotive products can be done in 28 nanometer <coughs> saying that that's good but also we should be cognizant of the fact that basically an indian fab whether it's a 40 28 nanometer today we are sitting in 2023 by the time it is fully operational and working we are talking about 2027 2028 time frame right so we should also have a forward looking analysis that would these products still make sense at that point of the time right okay. mm. uh, i think they would but a proper analysis has to be done by the people who are putting their billions of dollar and the government putting billion dollar we should not just stay with today's analysis that these products are needed because if i take a automotive product right four years it take fab to come one year to get it operational then basically i will tape out the automotive chip then it basically it will take another two years to qualification so we are talking about a automotive product being at least eight year cycle from today okay now we have to basically sit down either some of us or basically people who do this kind of analysis whether seven or eight years down the road 28 nanometer or 14 nanometer products in automotive will it be really have that kind of the market which we are seeing we cannot depend on today's analysis that's what i'm saying that and i don't have the data or crystal ball to tell what's going to happen in 8 years down the road but there are people who do this for basically livelihood consulting companies and all those things right i think somebody should do a forward looking projection today it looks good 
40 and 28 nanometer look good. But will it look good six, five, four years down the road, five years down the road, eight years down the road? I think that analysis has to be. Okay, great, thanks. The other, uh, the other uh, thing that you raised is about the fabulous design or essentially IC design companies. See, both in Silicon Valley and in India, uh, and you probably yourself experienced that, not too many investors are very knowledgeable or familiar with the sector, and too many investors also think it's very high risk because, you know, there is a certain gestation period and then uh, when, when you're spoiled by uh, essentially other kinds of sectors which have more sex appeal for lack of a better word, how do you uh, get uh, to support these fabulous design you know, firms? Yeah. The answer is very simple. If you look at the incentives given by the DLI scheme, right? I think you are an investor. If somebody is paying basically 70% of the cost of the project, then your risk is only 30%. Okay. Uh, and that too, basically, probably some other ways of mitigating it. So, unlike that uh, prior three years back or two years back when the DLI type of the scheme was not there, right? Suppose a uh, low complexity chip fabulous startup takes about $5 million to develop the first product, right? Then you have to basically, as an investor, plus $5 million, right? Today, you are basically looking at one $1.5 million investment also, which is very similar to what people will put in the uh, uh, software and other area, right? And if you look at the gestation period of creating real business, software firms take about the same time. They get into hype cycle early, but by the time they do basically start doing real business, I would love to see CRAD reaching $1 billion revenue in next 10 years, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There might be a lot of hype, but basically when will they reach $1 billion revenue for justify the kind of the uh, uh, market valuation they have? So mm -hmm. there is a lot of hype in these kind of the companies, but them to real, real business, real product, mm -hmm. I think it still takes seven to 10 years for any company, whether it's software or hardware. And uh, I think this 70% basically cost borne by the government, mm -hmm. I think that's a fantastic news for anybody uh, to do this thing. Second thing is that for India, we don't, as a fabulous designs, we don't have to run to the cutting edge chips, okay? There are a lot of utility chips, okay? Which, where the end product companies are in India. Okay, I'll take an example of a chip which goes into a fan. Okay, we sell hundreds of millions of fan in the country, right? Now, why can't we design that chip in India? It's a low complexity chip, maybe it can be done basically three, four million dollars. And it has a local domestic market because the product companies are in India, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a huge opportunity sitting for doing what I call these utility chips. Okay, they are not basically your uh, 180, 128 core ARM processor type of the chips or a mobile processor chip, it will take huge investment and huge time and expertise. There are these utility chips which can become the foundation of the fabulous companies in India. Third point, right? I think it is small, but if you look at the exits by the companies like Steridian and others, right? I think there is a lot of to say about the return on investment for the money which VCs have put in, right? Okay. Within very short time, they got basically eight to 10 multiples of their return their investment, right? So there are few examples, but I think we are getting more fabulous success examples, Sankhya, Steridian, Aura, Cyril. Uh, maybe it's a handful today, less than 10, but we are building that portfolio of model companies which have basically become successful and given a good return to the investors. So I think these are three points I'll say about the fabulous companies. Okay, so the, my takeaway is that PLI is a game changer, but I've also heard that PLI has had uh, somewhat of a slow start. Uh, do you have any idea? Some of these seem to be a little bit 
bogged down in contract negotiations between the private parties and the government and so on? See, there is a PLI part to the manufacturing and there is a DLI part, right? Okay. Mm. Uh, now, governments world over have their own processes and basically uh, internal mechanisms, right? Uh, which basically sometimes take huge deliberation because you are playing with the public money, right? Uh, even basically countries like US took almost one and a half to two years to pass the CHIPS Act, right? Uh, just mm -hmm. passing it, right? So I think, yes, it could be faster, but sometimes talking to the government guys, the amount of the processes they have to go through because of the basically nature of the public money, I'll say maybe it could have been done three to six months before, but we are not that slow. Uh, I think uh, three companies have already been, been given go ahead for DLI, okay? Uh, design link incentive and there are about three to six more to be announced in a month's time. So process is moving forward. Some of the things where a lot of money is at stake, takes a lot of due diligence in terms of the finance and number of the departments it has to go through and things like that, right? So see, when I look these problems from outside, I thought what you said, but now not insider fully, but when I talk to some of the people in the bureaucracy and I can understand what processes and that basically due diligence they have to go through. So in summary, we could be faster, but we are not that slow. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I'm gonna switch gears and ask you a little bit about your own personal experience as an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, you were one of the first movers in the design services space, you know, when you left Intel and even within Intel, I think the first foray. Um, and then when you left Intel, what was your experience at the time? That was almost, uh, what, 15 years ago, more than 15 years ago? Yeah, see, we started basically within Intel through Intel Microtronics in 1999. Right? So it's almost 25 years now, right? Okay. Yeah. And although basically it was not a product company, but it was not a design services company also, because we were doing basically all the way to supplying the volume silicon to our customers. Right? We are just taking the idea, developing the chip, basically taking it through the production process, which any product company will do, scaling up to high volume silicon. And then our business model was to give silicon and make money on silicon, not in anari, which typical design services company make, right? Mm -hmm. So it was basically close to what ASIC company model was that time by TI and IBM and all those people do ASIC, right? Mm -hmm. uh, experience wise, entrepreneurship always basically make you grounded, first of all. <laughs> so uh, we left Intel and uh, we said, okay, uh, no money, no funding. We said, okay, we'll give ourselves six months. Either we basically raise the funding and basically, or we just go back and find work, right? Uh, somebody, some will give some at least little bit of work because of the, we were still technical, right? And then one of the things which I typically tell Indian semiconductor entrepreneurs, right? Don't sit under a tree and think that basically mango will fall on your head. You have to go and grab the mango. You have to pack your bags, go to Silicon Valley. If your idea is good, you will get funding. If you expect basically sitting here, you will get the funding. It's very good to be very difficult, right? Even the companies which have Indian arms like Sequoia and others, I think it's best to basically go to where the source of funds are there, convince those guys, I think there is a huge opportunity. They will basically listen to good ideas. And sometimes I think we unnecessarily criticize that Indian investors are not putting the money in the hardware. Maybe we are not also pitching the right ideas to them, right? But things are turning tight, right? Like a risk five company got basically $3 million from Sequoia today, right? And, but you have to just basically try harder. You cannot just basically assume that 
oh, investors are not there. I think if there is a, basically you are very strongly convinced about your value proportion and idea, I'm very sure from my own experience that you will find an investor. Mm -hmm. Second thing is that basically just when we're talking about finding the investor investing company, right? Typically our fabulous startups are started by techies. Okay? They don't have a solid business guy basically as a part of their team, mm -hmm. which can be spokesperson, which can basically wow the audience, whether it's a VC or other person, right? I think that personality, whether it's coming from business or other areas, right? That is very essential to be part of the team, right? If you go to a startup and say, you have to spend 25% on sales, marketing, promotion, they will say, Pagal hai kya to? basically, why will I spend basically 25% on this, right? That's what they will say, right? Uh, but I think just learning from the experience, I think that worked very well for us. We had the people in all the, our startups who can play role of a spokesman, visionary, champions, and your CEO has to be chief sales officer, not chief technology officer, right? I think that's very essential for the success of a startup, right? So always have one person basically in your team which can do this wow factor in terms of the sales, marketing, vision, spokesperson, whatever you call, right? He is the face of the company in many sense. I mean, that changes everything, right? Basically, for, for us in Open Silicon, it was basically Navid Shirwani who did that magic. And subsequently, for later startup, I basically learned from him, played that role, right? So I think that is very, very critical. Whatever the technical skill that people have, until you have that knack of basically convincing a customer, convincing a VC, convincing a basically uh, partner, I think your technology is one side, you will not basically achieve your goals till you have that success. That the, the other question I had is in terms of as India kind of starts its journey in phase three and every country which are strong, they have created certain zones, right? I mean, hubs, you can call them the hubs are basically the ecosystem uh, which uh, has the support uh, for, uh, you know, companies to kind of set up. Where do you think India is going to have its hubs? So I don't know. I have a slightly different view than most of the people. I think manufacturing has to be concentrated. The design has to be distributed. Okay. Right. Uh, because the way India is, I don't know whether it will work for every other country, but the way India talent ecosystem and everything else is there, federal, state, this thing. So... I've been always saying the manufacturing start in one place, right? That's where every other country is there. Right now, basically, Gujarat seems to be the prime destination for this. Although other, basically, states like Karnataka, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu are vying for it. But my suggestion is don't distribute manufacturing too much, right? One place will be ideal, maximum two places. Mm. Otherwise, you will not be able to build the right infrastructure and the ecosystem to support the manufacturing. Your uh, logistics inefficiencies will be too much. Like, for example, if somebody has to set, set up a chemical or gas plant right, to support the fab ecosystem, we are not even done at one place. Now we are thinking of doing it five places. How will that happen? Mm -hmm. So I'll say one or two places for manufacturing. Design should be completely distributed one fabulous company in every district of India should be the minimum goal for India. Okay. How many districts are there in India? 760. Okay. Good. So last question, Satya. This was uh, very interesting. Um, what is your advice for entrepreneurs? I hope that there are many entrepreneurs who have, who have um, on this uh, webinar what is your advice to them, given your experience, both in terms of interfacing with the government, in terms of your product vision, and in terms of your past experience on the design? So first is basically choosing the right product, right? Which has basically like market domestically and globally. 
Second is the team. Uh, you need to have basically right team with the right balance, as I said. Okay. Third is basically set up your company correctly from the day one, right? Don't go with basically a lot of assumption between partners and all of those people. I've seen too many problems there. Have a very clear cut, written down understanding and following all the rules of the government in terms of basically share allocation, equity allocation. Don't leave it to mutual understanding. Document everything from the day one, right? Because initial friendship and understanding sometimes basically does not work out when basically things go forward. So have everything written down, clearly understanding. So product, team, clear cut model, uh, and just basically go get it, right? Basically don't wait for investor to come to you, you go to the investor, wherever they are. Okay, well, thank you, Satya. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Abha right now. There. There are some questions from the audience. In fact, I see almost 15 questions. Yeah. So I'll turn it over to Abha. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Siddharth and Satya. Thank you. So a lot of questions from audience. And um, so I, first question I picked up from, uh, from one audience is about the change in technologies are taking place towards the, these fab fabrication so the the upgradation to free electron laser as the laser source for lithography is coming up and how this technology the fabric conventional fabrication technology is going to stand with that so is the scenario is going to be seen for that so that's the question so see laser is upcoming technology but it has not proven itself for the high volume production yet, right? Whereas the traditional photolithography, EUV to the photo mask and traditional basically stepping and all those things, right? Has proven technology for mass production and scaling to high volume, right? Laser, as you know, basically, basically kind of scan the whole thing uh, rather than having a kind of a, uh, negative of a picture which can basically have a chip uh, uh, done. So I think it's still some time to see whether the laser based lithography will scale to the volume production, uh, which basically typical photolithography has achieved, right? So I think interesting technology, but scaling and the volume production still has to be seen. Yeah, right. So another question I picked up is, the, is there any vision regarding which product sector should be given priority in terms of manufacturing? So examples are also given like a small sensors for automobile industry or like having big processor or like, yeah. So that's, that's a question. See, in our industry, Foundry has a basically role of providing technology to basically product designer, okay? So they provide, let's say 28 nanometer process technology and wafers you can build on the technology. The products which has to be done in the foundry has to be decided by the fabulous companies. So manufacturing company does not decide basically which product to build until unless we are talking about IDMs like Intel, Micron and others, right? And in the current scheme of the things, whatever manufacturing units coming for the fab, they are all foundry in the nature. In that case, your customer or the fabulous companies will define these products, right? It could be automotive, as I said, industrial, IoT, all of those kind of the things, right? So fab does not decide what products to build on these wafers. They provide a stable and high yielding technology to the customer. Customer decides basically what products to be built. Now, when we are doing DLI, which is doing the fabulous company, there we can target certain product segments specifically, which are more promising for India. Just like I took an example of a fan, right? If I can do a chip for a fan, okay, that is very useful for India. If I can do a chip for the two wheeler, Ignition system, something simple as that, right? That is useful in India. So product companies have to look at the product irrespective of the technology. The fabrication companies have to provide the technology irrespective of what products can build, right? Uh, 
Obviously, as a business, they will have to do analysis who their customers are going to be. If I am putting a foundry, then I need to know who is going to buy my weapons, right? So that commercial analysis, each company will do on their own, but their primary job is to provide the technology, not do their own products. Right, yes. So another uh, few questions on the current developments and, and the what kind is very specific specific uh, about the what are the progress we are making so one is the efforts towards the ancillary development or utility support support infrastructure development so what we are doing towards it like you mentioned about the chemical gases and all these plants so is there and that just coupling to the same thing in means you mentioned about the manufacturing of mobile phones so is it all about the complete product or it's, is it just the focused on the processor or optical imagers lens or some kind of parts only so in in terms of yeah i'll say let's not confuse electronics product development to the semiconductor product development right okay when i'm making a mobile phone i really will go wherever basically i can get the best and the cheapest semiconductor right I cannot depend that I will wait for a fab in Gujarat to come and then I will take a process from them. That's how does it work, right? Tomorrow, if I have to create a competitive product to let's say OnePlus, right? I have to get best chips and best technology from wherever and my focus should be on the product design of a phone, right? When I'm talking about semiconductor products, then basically I have to design a product which has a high volume potential, right? And I give a couple of examples. So the two questions are very different. Coming to infrastructure side, so infrastructure has two parts. One is the physical infrastructure, like water, electricity, land, logistics, all of those things. I think we are basically currently living in a new India where these things are never a problem. We can do any world-class infrastructure of any basically uh, scale or quality. So leave no doubt there is no issue in creating the infrastructure. Right? We are basically, uh, I think 15 years back, people used to talk, Pani kaan se aega, Bidli kaan se aega, all of those things. I think that's uh, in new India, that's not a question anymore, right? Now, specialty chemicals, specialty gases, all of that, basically, that's a business. If I have a fab, if I'm giving a money for a vendor to come and provide me gases, he will come because he has to sell his gases somewhere, right? So that's never a problem. But as Siddharth was asking, trying to do that at too many places in India. Suppose we make 10 fabs in 10 cities in India, then it will be a challenge for anybody to supply to that. But if we concentrate our manufacturing efforts in one or two places and make it basically economies of scale, then infrastructure and ecosystem in terms of the raw material supply, gas, chemicals, raw wafers, uh, uh, equipment, spare parts, and all of those things, they will come because they have to do business. Infrastructure, Pani Bidli, if we have to put a des desalination plant and basically uh, see, we will do that, right? When we are talking about $5 billion investment, that takes $100 million only, right? We can all do it, right? So I think I'm in a no doubt that basically with the right focus, we are capable of doing anything in the infrastructure and the ecosystem side. Next, very interesting is the role of chat GPT in the VLSI design. So your comment on that. See, just like any other area, certain point of the time, your mundane function will be done by basically AI, which is repetitive, right? Suppose I'm 20 companies are basically designing a ALU, which is similar, right? Or an adder, which is similar, right? Right now, there is no way of sharing that knowledge today, right? So every company has to start from the scratch and build it until unless they buy the IP from somewhere, right? So we are doing the same thing again and again, right? So chat GPT can do it. Chat GPT or any, uh, let, chat GPT, any large language model, whatever we call it, right? Whether it's writing a code for a bubble sort or a sorting algorithm, or writing a very long code for a sim simple function, which is very repetitive across all the designs. I think there is no point in spending basically very expensive engineer's time on that, right? He can do higher level function. So 
that level of automation will come in the design. It will come in the EDA tools. So the design tools which we use for chip design, right? They will become smarter to learn from the past. Next, we don't do that many different type of the designs. If you put 20 people from 20 companies together, you'll find basically 80% of the things they are doing is similar, right? But yeah. we can share in company environment, but AI makes it enable either in the design tool or basically coding the design and so on and so forth. So certainly large language model and other AI ML tools, chat GPT being one, but there may be more specialized one and so on and so forth in coming years. Will certainly make basically design process much more basically efficient. Uh, there's no doubt about it because I think we are doing a lot of repetitive things, right? Uh, repetitive things a machine can do better than human. Yeah, truly. So um, comment about uh, cheaper electronics or having a competition with Chinese products. I think today's global supply chain, there is nothing like basically Chinese products are cheaper. Okay. You can build the same quality product and same or lower cost if you put your business model together correctly. And we have done it. So I'm not talking out of basically just theoretical knowledge. We have built few products in the electronics area, which are of the global standard, global quality. And we were able to achieve basically same or better price as Chinese products for the same quality, right? So I think since the supply chain for the raw material which goes into these products, right, is global, I think uh, there is not that much difference between where do you do things, right? Manufacturing in India is as efficient as manufacturing in China, right? Semiconductor components come from the global company, not from the China. There is a lot of myth that semiconductor components come from China. China basically produces about 10 to 12% of the semiconductor components only, that to low end, right? Uh, your processor comes from MediaTek or Qualcomm. Your memory comes from the Micron or Western Digital. Your camera comes from the Sony, okay? So very China in all of it, right? So you have to put the right business model together to basically get your products right. If you look at the key high value element in basically any of these products, right? I think you can stitch together a, and wherever you have to use China, use China. As long as my product is basically cost competitive, I own the product, I own the IP. If I have to take something from China, just take it. What does mean? I'm not ashamed of doing it, right? If I have to buy five components from China and that is available cheaper, be it, as long as the product ownership is with me, right? Yeah. It can be done. It has been done by several people, including the Epic Foundation, which we have this, this thing. We have rolled over two products, right? One is a uh, 65 watt GAN charger and one is 8 inch tablet. And we were able to achieve basically same quality and same price as the big, big brand names, right? So I think it is doable. You have to just put your right model together. So uh, next set of questions, which a few people have asked about the training or the, or, or the, the yeah. So, uh, so one question is about the, why aren't India focused mainly on the offset uh, first rather than focusing on high and low front end fabrications, which require use to close to three nanometer to be competitive. And also how do we have enough manpower to cover fab works other than college degrees. So, and also relevant to the same question that Miss, what do you think that Miss, Miss, we need the, these uh, talent right away. So how these can be quickly produced rather we wait for these degrees to come up in, in, in several schools and we wait for it. Multiple questions, right? Okay. So one is OSAT versus high technology node. So India is not focusing right now on three nanometer, five nanometer, because nobody will even give the technology for those nodes, right? And those are very expensive, as well as basically achieving the product maturity, yield, wafer, quality, all of those things are going to be very tough in the beginning. So India is basically working on 
what you can call n minus one or n minus two node at Siddharth set 28 nanometer, 40 nanometer, that node, right? Now, OSAT, ATMP, and the basically semiconductor fab in these nodes have to go hand in hand. So, OSAT might take two years to basically start getting operational. Fab might take four years to get operational. So, I cannot wait for OSAT to get done and then start fab. Then my fab will be get operational in six years. So, some of these things have a different maturity time, but we cannot do it sequentially. We have to start them parallelly. A compound semiconductor fab, OSAT, and other things can mature in two years. A 28 nanometer fab may mature in four to five years. A basically 10 nanometer fab may come subsequently. So we have to look at parallel execution of these things because everything is a different timeline. Now, coming to the talent part, right? There are two parts of the talent. One is the design talent and one is the manufacturing talent, right? There are a lot of programs being put together by the government, other academic institutions to train the manufacturing technicians to run these factories. So fab is like a factory, okay? Uh, most of the workers are most technicians level, skilled technician level, okay? So we have about three years to basically produce these technicians, okay? We are not needing it today because it will take two years to do the construction of these fabs and all of those things, right? So I think right strategies and programs in being put together, the two years we will get this manufacturing technicians and so on and so forth. Design engineers, we are already producing a lot, okay? But we need to basically increment quality and quantity, okay? And that can happen in three, four years, basically, because we have, uh, a lot of institutes basically doing uh, education in these areas. Obviously, we need to increase the number of institutions and also depth of education in this level, uh, also at the UG level. But I think design side, again, probably next one to two years, we have to basically work with the existing ecosystem. And in about three to four years, the new programs will start producing the results. So, so manufacturing is not immediately needed. We are not starting a fab tomorrow. It will take four years, right? So we have time to plan and execute for the talent on those areas. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sakya. So over to Sushila. I think this was a very, very fascinating uh, discussion today. So thanks so much, Satya. We could, as I said at the beginning, we could not have asked for someone better than you to do this uh, yeah, session. Yeah, and yeah. get us really charged up, you know, about, about uh, becoming a semiconductor nation. And Siddharth, uh, thank you for taking time and, uh, uh, you know, bringing out some very uh, thought-provoking issues and uh, discussions. So thank you for that. Uh, in, so just to summarize, in our Atmanirbhar series, today we looked at the semiconductor uh, and electronics sector. and. Uh, we started by understanding why we absolutely must make India a semiconductor and electronics product nation. Um, and uh, uh, Satya talked about it as in every sense, so that uh, I thought it's important to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, we looked at the fact that it is as strategically important as defense or space or any of those sectors. Because we are touched by semiconductors every moment of uh, our, our day, whether it's night or day, it's, we are touched by devices, implants, all sorts of stuff. So it's, it's very important that we do uh, make ourselves self-sufficient with respect to electronics. And then we said, what is it that characterizes India and makes it, uh, you know, it's not a pipe dream. It is possible for us to be able to uh, actually become this nation of, uh, you know, uh, semiconductor nation. And uh, basically three dimensions, market, manufacturing, and manpower. And we do have an ecosystem that has developed over the last uh, eight years and more. And so that talked us through the, our journey in the last four or five decades, uh, the, the history and, and what has happened and why we are where we are. And what gives us the confidence that we can become uh, this semiconductor nation? We are already doing over $300 billion worth 
of uh, electronic products being manufactured here. We have a lack in a quarter chip designers. Every global semiconductor and electronics company has set up a design center here in India and so on and so forth. So that's what gives us the confidence that we can do it. Today, uh, almost no value is being added by India, whether it is in manufactured products, products that are manufactured here or imported products. And what are the implications with respect to all of that? They, they, they fall into buckets such as components, economic and security, but most importantly, it's about self-reliance. And the self-reliance is a theme that we have seen over 70 odd years of our uh, existence. Um, and, and I think that itself has made a very strong case for why India must absolutely manufacture chips here. If we want to build better, cheaper, globally competitive, innovative products year after year, it's just not a one-time thing, it's a year after year thing, we need chips for sure. And then we looked at the ecosystem for IDM and, and for Fabulous and what, what it calls for. Clearly, need, we need semiconductor and electronic products both, and, and it has to be done uh, you know, hand in hand in, in parallel. So what would be required for all of this? Fabulous, at least one in every, or every one of the 760 districts is, is what Satya suggested, and, and why not? Raw materials, equipment, supply chain, uh, and infrastructure, and you know, there was this discussion between Siddharth and Satya on with thoughts on how to make sure that we create econom economies of scale and do not spread ourselves too thin. And then of course, many enabling factors such as our long-term policies. The current government of India's scheme of PLI and DLI is, uh, is really one of the best in the world with respect to incentives. There are also EDA tools that are being provided centrally and CDAC, uh, tapes out chips for now. So there is a lot of government support already in place. There is also the India Semiconductor Mission, which is going to provide, a, uh, going to invest more than 200 crores to support skills and research. So all of this is uh, just tells us that the, the environment is right for us to turn into uh, a semiconductor nation. And then we saw a few suggestions that came from uh, Satya as well as from Siddharth during the discussions. One is more incentive for product development. The, uh, the need to leverage government procurement, which is what every other nation has done anyway. Start young. So it, you know, the inputs that are required for us in term, from a skills perspective must really start at an early age. A forward-looking analysis is required for what investments to make in what, what kind of technology, et cetera. So we're talking of at least eight years out, if not more. And finally, a very good business, solid business model is required. We also, you know, the discussion span many aspects of wide range of topics, wide range of aspects, uh, technology aspects such as, you know, do we go 28 nanometer, 180 nanometer, something else. And uh, the second thing was, uh, and finally, we, while we could be moving faster, we are not lagging behind us. We are not too slow either. I, th I thought that was a nice uh, statement from Satya. We do have the capability to be able to set up world-class fabs here. Um, you know, it's not like, uh, it's a, you know, uh, 10 years or 15 years ago. We do have the capability today to be able to set up a world-class fab here. And I just love the conviction with which Satya uh, brought that out. And um, so with this, I, I just want to say thank you again. And thank you for our audience. Your questions were very valuable and very interesting, added a lot of, uh, you know, uh, insights to the discussion itself. I just want to say, wish everybody the best. And we hope to see us, Atmanirbhar, in this area in the near future. For our audience, this recording will be up on our YouTube channel come Monday. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you next week. We, we will have another uh, edition of, uh, of one of our webinars next week. We look forward to seeing you there. And Abha and I, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Thank you for joining. Thank Sushila, thank Abba, and special thank to Siddharth. Basically, we have been discussing these topics for the last 20 years, and something real is happening now. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful.